Okay, Francois, if you want to get, uh, if you want to get started. Sure. So, well, hi everyone. I'm Francois. I'm one of the uh, CCFP EM residents at McGill. Just to confirm, you see the the slide right now? Yes, we do. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, I wanted to present my cat on the discussion of level of care in the emergency room. I figured with time that this was actually extremely hard to do for me. Um, we didn't really get any formal teaching regarding this. And I thought I didn't do a really great job. I often realized that the way I approached level of care with the patients, I was basically dictating what they would, uh, what they would choose in the end, the way I would, I would discuss it with them. And I've had many cases in the eMERGE where I actually had a patient who was quite unstable or had a really poor prognosis, but no level of care was actually ever discussed with them or was accessible to us. And I thought I didn't have the tools to, to discuss this. So just a bit of history regarding CPR and level of care. Well, CPR was introduced in the 1960s. Um, it rapidly became just routine emergency procedures for us. But in the 70s, we kind of realized um, that in some patients, it might cause more harm than benefit. And then the DNR forms actually uh, appeared. And why this topic is important? Well, all, our, all of these data are just are from the US, but um, just to show some numbers, over 75% of uh, older adults to over 65 years old will visit the eMERGE um, in their last months of life. And 13% of older secure adults um, will have no cult status documented. That's an academic ED in the US. It's a cross-sectional study, but they looked at patient over 80 years old or a bit younger, over 65, with one indicator of high-risk short-term mortality. And in their EMR, um, only 13% had something documented. So I think this is maybe something we could have similar to at the UMHC. And when they, when they did larger studies to try to understand what's more important for older adults, um, it seems that quality of life comes more often um, as more important than life expectations. Um, and how can we efficiently discuss healthcare in the emergency room? It was a bit a challenge to uh, gather data on this. Most of it is basically observational data or um, expert's opinion, but um, I'll try to go over what I, what I gathered. And this is just a picture that I found on the critical care conference in Australia where they were talking about end of life. And um, what would we think as a good end of life? We could see a patient like this, which seems to be an ICU with all the monitors and the high tech intensive care, but for a patient that might look like a nightmare more than anything else. This is the first uh, paper I wanted to go over. It's, it's, it's a bit old, it's from 2011, but they went over basically what I'm gonna go over during this presentation and why is it difficult to um, discuss a DNR forms level of care discussion with, with patients? Well, again, we don't really provide enough information to really allow the patient to make informed decision. Often we, we would neglect to involve the patient values and goals when we discuss this with them. And we might not provide recommendations based on these goals. They also uh, describe the fact that in larger urban academic EDs, um, a center, sorry, um, like maybe what we have here, um, there's less DNR forms compared to more remote hospitals. And their suggestions, and these are three points that I found all over in the literature, and I'm going to go over a bit later as well. Um, so they suspect, they suggest, first of all, to really determine what's the patient goal of care. Uh, it, it certainly takes time to do this, uh, but I thought just a simplified approach might help. And then e educating the patient as well, based on their prognosis. Um, so we need a bit of, of a baseline for this. And then uh, with these two elements to actually give recommendations to the patient based on their goals and prognosis, to really have a more efficient discussion and to really involve the patient. Just looking at what we have here in Canada, that's an observational study from 2015. They looked at 16 hospitals, also some of which were in Quebec, but I didn't, couldn't really find which ones. Um, and they recruited seriously ill patients um, and or their family members, if the patient couldn't really be involved in the discussion on uh, medical wards. And this was two days after the admission. So the, the stress of the symptoms that brought them in in the first place was, um, was a bit more uh, dealt with. And what they looked at is what's the mismatch between the level of care they had in the EMR or at the hospital compared to what they actually really wanted. And 
the way they did this is certainly not the real way we'll have in Emerge, but they would have a nurse doing face-to-face -face conversation and really going over what they want as level of care. And then they would look at the, the form they have. And 37% um, of patients had a medical error. And most of them were actually over-treated. Patients who didn't want to have advanced care as CPR, but actually were labeled as uh, resuscitate. And a very, very small minority would have the opposite. They would want CPR, but they were not having it. And they, they also realized that, well, they also discussed that when family members were involved in the care of the patient, this was less likely to happen. Um, yeah, so it just shows that even if this is not what we do in Emerge, we don't have a nurse talking over level of care with patients, it just shows that the difference between the discussion clearly has, a, has an impact. And this could explain why there's such a mismatch between level of care forms and what the patients really want. It's, a, again, an observational study from um, two university hospitals in the US. And what they did was I found pretty interesting. They actually recorded the discussion regarding level of care. Um, they had 80 encounters in total. And they, they had the printout of what was discussed. And they would compare this with a background of what bioethicists and professional associations would give as recommendation. And these were pretty much, again, to go over prognosis goals, go over CPR to know what the patient has to expect, outcome and outcome of CPR, I mean, and then recommendations based on, on what's the background of the patient. And what they found was, well, first, the discussions were often short. This is also the reality of, of what we're faced with. Um, and it was mostly focused on the use of life sustaining intervention as opposed to larger life goals. Um, descriptions of CPR, if there was, was mostly framed in general and not associated to the patient's actually specific scenarios and, and realities. Not many physicians actually went over the outcome of CPR or even provided any recommendation. And they, they again noted that basically no one actually went over the likelihood of survival of CPR. Um, so it created bias as well when you're a patient and you might be a sicker patient. If you don't know what's exactly what's your outcome and your prognosis with CPR in your situation, often you would, it, it's easier for you to overestimate what's your, what's your chances of survival and, um, and then accept, accept intensive care in the end. And if you have a, the time to really go over these two, the prognosis and what's CPR, there's less risk of having um, an over-treatment, I would say, as discussed a bit earlier. And their conclusion, again, is really to go over the goal of care to patient, the prognosis, and give clear recommendation. This is really what we, what's the best we can do when we discuss CPR. That's one of the examples they had in their study um, that I found quite interesting. Um, it was the physician asking, for some reason, you got so sick that your heart stopped beating or your lungs got so sick that they couldn't breathe on their own. Would you want us to attend to bring you back to life with electricity shocks and other things? The patient said yes, and that was basically it. And that was a 67-year-old woman with a cholangiocarcinoma that was admitted for fever and abdominal pain, so a high risk of decompensation, and not such a great baseline either. And that's one of the pitfalls, I would say, of discussing level of care. It's the all or nothing. It kind of gives a binary choice to the patient. It's either do you want to do to have everything or then the rest is basically nothing. And there's, of course, there's many things in between that we could, that we could do to help um, promote survival and comfort as well. And that's another example of um, what I've heard and I'm doing as well when I discuss CPR. And it's, it's kind of a scare tactics where we say we would break ribs, we, we need, might need to intubate, so put a tube down your throat, be on the breathing machine. If you go to ICU, they might put nylons on your neck. Um, it might certainly work, um, but those are not really recommendations. It's mostly, it, it, it could be manipulative, like manipulative actually when we kind of, like I was saying at first, kind of discuss um, and dictate the choice of the patient when we present a level of care, which is not really the, our goal. And that's also what, what I, I'm always doing basically is go over the form with them and present a menu basically. Um, it, it, like, do, do you want CPR, intubation, or maybe just BiPAP? Would you like shocks or pressors? And it kind of leaves the patient with overwhelming different choices to choose from. And they don't, if we don't give 
a good background. They don't really understand what, what's at stake. And I had a code actually when I was uh, doing my residency in family medicine in St. Mary's where the patient had a code blue. We started CPR, intubated the patient, and then we realized that the patient was refused pressors. So running a code, CPR intubation with no pressors didn't really make any sense. So clearly the, the patient didn't really understand what, what was the choices there. That's a funny-ish study. Um, it's, it's old, but it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they actually looked at all the episodes of ER and Chicago Hope uh, for a few seasons. And they described what, they, what was the outcome of CPR actually. And this is what the patients are, are watching on TV and might think what actually CPR is. And what they found was, well, most CPR patients were actually younger patients. Um, but the vast majority of them survived with really good outcome and were walking out of the hospital thankful. And so it seems like neurologically speaking, they were, they were intact. And I think this is something to be aware of. Again, like I was saying before, when we talk about what's the outcome of CPR, this, is my, this might be what the patients are actually thinking when we discuss CPR with them. And this misconception um, has to be uh, addressed, or at least we have to, to think about it. And what would be the real outcome? Um, that's a retrospective court study from um, someone I'm going to go over again, um, who they actually looked into 262 hospitals in the US. It's a large number of patients. Um, and they looked at what's the outcome of just being intubated in the emergency room. So most often it's a crash intubation. And grossly, a third of intubated patients in the emerge, again from the US, um, are going to die during this hospitalization. And of course, the mortality increases with age. If we look at the over 90 year old bracket on the right, 50% will actually die in the hospital. And a minority of them will go home. And in, in, in the middle, these are patients that are not going home. And it ranges from going for a long care facility where they have help or just being unable to be weaned. And 13% of all these patients who are 65 year old and older will actually require prolonged mechanical ventilation and particularly a bit more of a third of them will never meet the criteria for weaning. So just being intubated in the emerge at least is a, is a significant deal. And then um, this is from the American Heart Association looking at what's the outcome of just having a cardiac arrest for intra-hospital cardiac arrest and uh, survival um, chances are basically 25%. And actually, 25% is not so much, but be, because this is intra-hospital, a good proportion of them would actually have um, good neural outcome. And I was a bit surprised when I read these numbers, but it looked pretty legit. It's from the American Heart Association, um, but they don't describe really much what's their good outcome. And I, it's numbers I've seen also in other studies where they would review um, the, the, the outcome of cardiac arrest in hospital. And the survival to hospital discharge was pretty much between 20% to 15%. And what could be helpful for us when we, when we want to have an idea of what's the prognosis of the patient is just having a, an idea of what's their trajectory of, of illness. And that's, that's um, an old paper, but I, I found it other, uh, other studies that were actually, um, they, they looked at many, many deaths, um, and they tried to classify the, the, these in four categories that had significant clinical differences. And the first one to the left would be the, the sudden death where you have a high, high function that you see on the left, and then a catastrophic event. And these patients, because they have such a good baseline, they certainly would benefit from intensive care, um, whatever that is, intubation, CPR, ICU. And then you would have to the right, the right, the terminal illness. And that's mostly like terminal cancer, for example, where they would have high functioning faces where they, I've, at this point, they certainly would benefit from intensive care, but then there's the steep decline in function. And so the prognosis of intensive intervention has, has less um, benefit in this case. And a question we could ask patients that are in this situation, like terminal illnesses, is basically how much time they spend in bed. And if they say that they spent more than 50% of their day in bed, their prognosis is pretty much over uh, like two months. So something to, to consider when we, when we have this conversation with these patients. And then the organ failure patient, that's mostly the COPD, CHF. Um, it's basically really a progression of exacerbations and you all, well, you have a regain of function after the exacerbation, but overall certainly a decline. And it's difficult to know 
which intervention will actually lead to death when we're faced with this patient. Um, but they benefit from intensive care if this is not their last one. And an idea that we could, uh, just to have an idea of what we could do, we could certainly ask them, comparing what's happening now to previous observations to know what we, what we could expect. And I think the most um, important one would be the frail patient. That's the older demented patients, for example, where their function is, is very low and they have um, kind of a really predictable course of their illness where they'll have more falls, aspirations, infection, and intensive care in this case is unlikely to improve their quality of life, which seems to be quite important, but will only really pr might prolong their life. And an approach to, to discussing this, this is from the emergency medicine page of the University of Ottawa that I, I found pretty simple, is to really just for us in the eMERGE target high-risk patients. So it could be unstable patients, um, patients with advanced cancer, comorbidities, or frail, like I just discussed, the, the, these uh, courses of disease, and patients of, um, at high risk of decompensation, for example, massive P or, or STEMI and then establish their function to kind of prognosticate what's, what's coming up and make sure we talk about their wishes again. And if they want, if they agree, we could certainly share recommendations again to help them choose. And I think sharing recommendations is, I'm, I'm like, it, it's difficult even if we have more information, but um, it's really the, the best we can do because they, they basically, like, like I said, they often have no idea. That's um, from the same author that did the, the studies of intubation in DEMERGE. Uh, it's one of the, the approach that he would suggest. And basically, um, this, is, this, this one was mostly for discussion with family members in, in critical situation. But again, the, the same points are coming back. And there's a good EM Crit podcast regarding this. And, um, and again, the baseline is really what's going to help us know what the remaining function will be after the, uh, the instance of care. And when we talk about patient values, it's, it's difficult to just ask, would you want CPR or not? But basically what they would accept as quality of life after resuscitation. So for some patients, for example, being bed bound or not medically intact would be worse than dying. Because I think for most, or I think for me at least, neuro, the neuro outcome is really what's the most important thing. Then to summarize the discussion we have with the patient and then make a recommendation. And again, avoid presenting a grocery list. Do you want A or B? But really just go ahead with, I would recommend intubation or not in this situation based on your, on, on your situation right now. And what they would also suggest is if we feel that something is medically inappropriate to just state it clearly. And that could help patients but mostly family members to kind of transfer the guilt to, um, to us. And really our job is to translate the medical realities in a way that a patient or family will, will understand. And certainly there's some, there's some patients or families, a minority of them, but still who are, um, I would say vitalists where they, they would want everything and anything done. And for, for these patients, it's, it's, it might be easier because we have our answer faster. And if they don't go with our recognition, well, that's, that's, that's perfect, that's their choice. And we don't have, of course, to change their mind. This is not the base of the, the discussion, but it's really, it might actually make things uh, fast, easier. And also a point that I think was important too, is when we, when we discuss level of care, also always advise the patient that this is a discussion we have with everyone that actually steps into the hospital. So they don't think that their situation is just gonna be going to go downhill from there, even if we think, if we have to target patients in the eMERGE, even if that's what we, we think. And something I found useful as well when I was talking about having the prognosis of neuro intact after um, cardiac arrest, this is a, a score, a GOFAR score, which is basically 13 categories, each conference points. You basically add, add up these points uh, in a cumulative fashion and, the fashion, and then you'll have the score, basically the, the likelihood of good outcome, neuro outcome after, uh, after resuscitation. It's, I think it was useful to guide the discussion, certainly when discussing prognosis, at least. Um, it's an older study, it's from 2013, but subsequent validations were, were actually done. And it comes from a registry of 51,000 cardiac arrest. And it's really to help the discussion at the admission. So it was only, only um, established for admission. So they, they excluded 
they, they were careful to exclude any characteristic that wouldn't be available to the admitting physician or to the emergency doc who's starting the conversation in the eMERGE. So for example, the rhythm of the arrest um, was not like it's not available for us, so they didn't include it or where the patient would be on the hospital. Is it at the end of the corridor or the ICU? There's another score as well that I found the CAS pre-score. I've, I've heard of this score before, but again, this score is, you need to know what's the rhythm of the patient. It basically helps you to, to know a specific patient in, in cardiac arrest. But for us, it's really just to discuss what we don't have any more information than this. This score, um, certainly um, help us. And oh yeah, sorry, I just want to, to, to underline that the neuro intact or minimal deficit they are using is really the patient has to be conscious, alert and able to work, but have mild neurological or psychological deficits like some mild dysphagia or cranial nerve abnormalities. So I, I thought this was pretty much what I would, I would want to know if I, if I was about to sign a DNR form or just establish medical health care. This study, even if it's from 90 to 51,000 patients, it's probably an overestimation of the outcome. Even if the outcome is often poor, once you had the categories in, um, those are all data from arrest patients that actually had resuscitation. So if you were so sick that you, you didn't like, I think most sicker, the sicker patients have less chances of getting resuscitated. Um, so they're not included in this study. So it actually might increase the likelihood. Um, and but this is this is also a, a pitfall when we discuss health care. We shouldn't use this to to give them the the numbers of of what's uh, what's their outcome, but to help us discuss um, instead of saying very very like zero point zero one percent, we would say it's very unlikely in your situation because otherwise we're again we're just keeping on bombarding patients with statistic or choices like I was saying a bit earlier. So in conclusion, I have five minutes more, but in conclusion, it's um, what seemed to be coming back and back in the literature, it's really three things. Discussing the prognosis with the patient more than the methods. And this is what I was doing. I was explaining CPR and bypass intubation. And for this, we have to know what's their function, their baseline actually. And then based on their wishes, which is not only do you want CPR or not, but really what quality of life would you would you be okay to live with if we try to prolong your life? And with these, we would give medical recommendations. And even as for even after putting this info together, it's I think it's still very difficult for me to have a good idea of what's what's to expect, what's there to, to give recommendations. Clearly, it seems that the patient don't really don't know any better. So I think it certainly will help. And those are uh, basically the articles I uh, I included and the, the website I went over. I don't know if there's any question, but always thank you very much. Thanks, Francois. That's great. That's a really uh, important topic, which I think we, we probably don't really speak about enough. I don't know if anyone has, we don't have any questions in the chat. Does anyone have any thoughts or they wanted to share about, about these discussions? And um, uh, I would like to thank you, Francois. Uh, a very important topic, uh, which uh, I think all of us, including me, we, we all struggle with. I would just like to share uh, what Dave uh, advised me when I was doing IC with him. Uh, he, he, he has similar approach to the one you suggested. Uh, he spends a little bit of time with the family, talking with them and trying to understand their values. And then based on that, uh, he would uh, make a recommendation uh, whether the patient is caring more about quality of life versus uh, uh, pro prolonging life. So similar to what you suggested. Great, thanks Mustafa. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I have thought like a lot about this, but I still find it so, so difficult for the patients who are like, let's say like not doing well on BiPAP. Uh, you're like, huh, I'm probably gonna have to intubate, but I'm not really sure what's going on. They're super sick, they're septic or whatever. Um, this is definitely not going in the right direction, um, but that patient is awake enough so that, that you can have a conversation with them, but doesn't seem to fully get what's going on. Um, and I've had like a number of these where I'm trying to explain to them, like, do you want your life to be prolonged as much as possible? Or like trying to kind of, kind of go about using the approach you said, and I still find it so, so difficult. So I appreciate the, the checklist you gave us just wondering if you 
have come up with any magic formula for those kind of specific need a rapid answer <laughs> uh, kind of situations. Unfortunately, no. And that's that's after a case, I've, a similar case, I thought I thought, okay, I really need to find a way to really discuss this with critical ill patients that are unstable. But it's so difficult. I didn't really know find anything, and that was my question as well. Unfortunately, it, it seemed that to me it made more sense to really just focus on going over this with everyone. But once the patient is very sick and we don't have a good level of care discussion, if we didn't do it earlier, well, yeah, we're a bit stuck. I didn't know. Unfortunately, I didn't find great things to to answer your questions. Okay, any, any other comments before we move on? Um, yeah, Mariam asks, in case the patient says, I don't know, which I agree often happens, you, you, you try and you, you, you do the conversation the right way, but the patient says, well, I don't know, what do you think, what, what should I do? Um, Francois, do you have any thoughts about what, or how do you approach that? Or If, if with everything they, they still can choose, I, 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 I guess I would, I would put level of care one in this case. I wouldn't feel comfortable enough. If they don't give me a clear answer to write what I think is best, I would, again, I think at this point, I would be quite paternalistic. I would tell them, in your situation, I think this is inappropriate. And I wouldn't, if I was in your place, I wouldn't want to go with CPR intubation in ICU. I would stick with the maximum care on the ward, for example. And if that doesn't work out, I, I guess I would, I would put everything. But I think it's one of the situations where we could be more paternalistic because really patient won't have any other choices. And even if we don't feel like we know much or I don't feel like I know much about level of 